so we're being recorded and that's good. Um, so, um, right, so I'll move, move past my title. And first I'll say a little bit about the structure of the, of the talk that I'm going to do. Um, and, and I'll first, I'll start by articulating my claim, which you, you saw, I think, in a blurb about the, about the talk. But I'm going to do this very, you know, um, I'll start by doing it very uh, academic argumentation style. But uh, it, uh, it's, as, as I talk further, uh, what I really want tonight is for us to savor um, some of these poetic texts and spend some time really um, um, both enjoying and also thinking and feeling our way into these into these poems. Uh, but the claim that 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 I'm making is um, somebody might have thought that epic poems, since they are they tend to be nation building poems, um, poems that that show people how to live precisely as members of a particular. Um, uh, ethnic, but also cultural, socio-political group, you might have thought that such poems were just triumphalist, right? In the sense of saying, okay, this is a Greek epic, um, uh, yay Greeks. And, and you might have thought that that entailed, you know, othering, othering the enemy, um, regarding the enemy as, you know, wicked, despicable, um, you know, not to be, not to be regarded. And um, it's, it's actually quite different in, in Homer and also in the later epic tradition. Um, there's a remarkable degree to which um, the, the, the others of epic poems, you know, uh, the, the, the people who are on the losing side of battles, uh, the people who are on the other side of the, of the conflicts from the, from the narrating side um, are typically portrayed uh, with, a, with a high level of compassion um, and, and interest. Uh, and that often is the thing that gives these poems so much of their um, emotional interest. Um, and it's possible to read the poems and so it, uh, without, really, without really noticing that, you know, and there's a tradition of, of reading the poems in that more triumphalist way. So I'm going to talk about three poems, three epic poems, and they're also the poems that, uh, that are going to be the backbone of the course that I'll be offering uh, in the winter this year. Uh, and the first one is Homer's Iliad, uh, which is a, a poem that we possess in written form, but it came into being um, over a period of centuries, around the seventh century before the Common Era. And it's about the Trojan War that happens in the Bronze Age Mediterranean. Uh, and the second one that I'll talk about is Virgil's epic poem called the Aeneas, the Aeneid, the Song of Aeneas, um, that was completed in 19 BC. Uh, and it's, it, so it belongs historically to the time of Rome in transition from the Republic to the Principate, but, but its setting is the same time as Homer's Iliad. It's about a particular hero from uh, Homer's epic named Aeneas, uh, who is a Trojan, so a member of the, you know, the losing side of, uh, of Homer's Trojan War who comes to Italy and in a complicated way uh, does this foundational act that is, that is going to lead to uh, the Roman people or lead to the, the Latin, you know, the, the Latin community, some, something like that. But that's complicated too because then there's a civil war in the second half of Virgil's Aeneid but everybody fighting on both sides of the civil war, you know, the Trojans and their allies on the one side, and then, then the, uh, you know, the native Italic peoples on the other, on the other side, they're all ancestors. You know, if you're a reader of, of, of the Aeneid, you're reading about these people fighting, um, and, and all of them, you know, are, are, are people who are, who are foundational, regarded as part of the, of the background and, and ancestry. Um, of, of, the, of the intended readers of the poem. And the third, the third poem that I'll talk about and I'll probably talk about it the least is this remarkable 20th century epic by Derek Walcott called Omeros. Uh, some people pronounce it Omeros. I tend to pronounce it more Omeros with the, with the French accent and there's, there's a reason for that. So uh, uh, Walcott comes from St. Lucia in, in, in the Caribbean. Uh, the action of the poem um, spans time. Uh, there, are, there are characters who have the names of Homeric heroes, 
uh, but but they're in French, and those people um, are are fishermen and 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 the people that they know, and they bear uh, Greek names. They bear the names of of Homeric uh, heroes, but it, in their in their French forms. But then Walcott's poem, you know, does all this amazing time travel, going back to the 18th century to the to the colonization of the New World and tran the, the transatlantic slave trade, but also spanning European history, American Indian history. And Walcott is someone who both ethnically and culturally, you know, very much has a hybridized complex identity, right? So he's writing about um, white colonials, white slave traders, African slaves, uh, American Indians, um, 20th century Caribbean, um, uh, you know, non-elite, um, non-elite oppressed labor, and and all of them form part of his cultural identity. Uh, and, and in doing so, you know, he he is engaging very deeply with the epic, uh, the epic tradition. So um, I'm going to talk the most about Homer. That will probably be more than half of my remarks, and I'm going to do a lot of of reading of texts that will be on the screen. Um, but uh, do please feel free as questions occur to you to write them in chat and um, Allison will definitely see them. I'm, I'm less likely to pick up on them, but at the end of, of talking about each poem, um, I'm gonna try to remember and Allison will, will remind me to, to stop and, and talk about any, any questions that come up. Uh, I plan to talk until about 7 p.m. Uh, and, and then turn it more into a conversation um, this is way more than I ever um, lecture uh, in, in a class. Uh, my students think I lecture. I, I, I think I just have a conversation and I, I get very talkative, but you know, that's that, whatever. I, I like for things to be more interactive. Um, I, I, did a, I did a timeline just, just to, for us to look at the, the sweep that I'm talking about. I'm talking about a, a period of Oh, you know, three thousand years, and by the time you get to the end of it, with Derek Walcott's poem, for which he received the the Nobel Prize in 1992, um, he is also interacting, you know, with with the Trojan War, for which the traditional date is is in the 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 twelfth century before the Common Era, and then it's five hundred years later that the Iliad comes into shape, and Rome is 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 founded, um, you know, sometime. Uh, sometime after that, and then becomes a republic. Uh, there's this period of um, more than a hundred years when Rome fights intensely with um, with its great rival, the uh, the northern uh, African city of Carthage. And I'm actually going to start with a with a, a little um, a little vignette, a little narrative vignette about that. Uh, and then in in 31 BC, Octavian. Uh, who will later be known as Augustus, defeats Mark Antony. That's, that's the Antony of Antony and, Cleo, and Cleopatra. And with that, he begins to establish this regime change in Roman culture. And that's the thing that, that is the historical, as it were, prompt of Virgil's poem, um, the Aeneid, which is kind of a celebration of this thing that, that Augustus is, is producing, but it's arguably also engaged critically with, with that project um, as well. And it is very strange too that, that Rome is a, is a culture that thinks of itself as being founded by Aeneas. That's strange because Aeneas is actually a hero from the Iliad, right? I mean, it's, it's as if we said that, you know, that, that the new world was, you know, discovered. We don't really people don't like to say the new world was discovered anymore because because the, the, the people in the, living there you know the indigenous people living there were, were there long before Columbus and and white people um, arrived but it's as if we said you know that, that the new world was discovered by Europeans in, in the person of somebody like you know Tristan from Tristan and Isolde you know uh, Rome is a culture that where where the the, the the foundation the foundation narratives are bound up with this epic tradition. Then in, in uh, the, the English early modern world in, in the 16 and 1700s, hundreds, hundreds, uh, at the time of you know, capitalist expansion, at the time of colonization, at the time when suddenly there's this very um, wealthy and also culturally hungry mercantile class who is suddenly willing to make poets you know, and, and musicians wealthy, 
you know, on the wealth that they have generated through things like colonization and, and the slave trade. And that in turn, you know, is the thing that, that, that bankrolls stuff like Dryden's translation of Virgil's Aeneid and Alexander Pope's uh, translation of, of Homer's Iliad. Pope is somebody who is very much an outsider, a Catholic, and therefore he couldn't go to you know, Oxford or Cambridge, uh, but he made his fortune through this translation of the, of the Iliad that he produced. Uh, then 1782, the Battle of the Saints, which is this moment when the English um, had, had scored a, a, a naval victory over the French for control of some islands in the Caribbean, including Walcott's home, um, St. Lucia. Uh, and uh, Walcott's poem is very much haunted by this, um, you know, by, by this submerged French, French presence. Um, so, okay, so let me move forward to this vignette that I love to start with. These days I'm just obsessed with this story in thinking about, um, you know, what it, what it means to regard the other who is my enemy with, um, with deep affective compassion. So let me say just a little bit more about Rome and Carthage and Carthage as the other, right? I mean, I'm, I'm definitely a Cold War baby. And so I grew up, you know, believe, I grew up being told that there, is, there are these people on the other side of the world who are terrible and dreadful and trying to destroy us and you can't say enough bad things about them. Well, that, that's the way that, that, that Rome, you know, taught their little kids about Carthage for over a century. And that's, that's what Carthage, you know, that's what Carthaginians grew up hearing about Romans. Um, in the second of the three Punic Wars, a general named Hannibal led his elephants over the Alps and almost conquered Rome. Um, um, there, there, uh, the Rome regarded as regarded Carthaginians as traditionally stereotypically liars, as deceitful. Um, there was there was a Roman statesman, Cato, Cato the Elder, who uh, at the end of every speech that he ever delivered in the Senate, he died uh, three years before Carthage was destroyed. But at the end of every speech, his last sentence was Caterum. Kenseo, Carthaginem, Esse, Delendam. Furthermore, I move that Carthage needs to be destroyed. Like whatever, whatever they were talking about, he wanted to remind the Romans that we need to exterminate, you know, we need to wipe out um, our enemy. So this general, Scipio Aemilianus, uh, is the one who finished off Carthage, right, at the end of the Third Punic War. And we have this, this narrative of account of him watching the destruction of the city of Carthage. And how does he respond? You know, does he like, you know, blow, blow trumpets and, and cheer for the, for the defeat of, of, you know, of Rome's great enemy? Just the opposite. So here's the story. Scipio looked upon the city of Carthage, a city which had reached its peak of power 700 years after its foundation, a city that had ruled over so many lands and islands and seas, a city rich with arms and fleets, elephants and money, a city equal to the mightiest kingdoms, but far surpassing them in bravery and endurance, since without ships or arms and in the face of famine, it had sustained continuous war for three years, a city that now was coming to its end in total annihilation, right? So this is Scipio looking at the city of Carthage and letting his, op his, his imagination open up into history, you know, and to think about the city of Carthage, you know, as, as being like a human being, having a life and, and a death. And as Scipio looked on, he is said to have shed tears, openly weeping for his enemies. Meditating deeply for a long time, he reflected upon the rise and fall of cities, nations, empires, and individuals as well. He thought of what happened to Troy, that once fortunate city, to the Assyrians, to the Medes, to the Persians who surpassed them all in power and later to the splendid Macedonian empire. And as he considered all these things, he said out loud, either deliberately or because, of the, because the words of the poet, and that means the poet Homer, just escaped his lips and he said, a day will come when sacred Troy shall perish and Priam and his people shall be slain. So he's thinking about this moment in the Iliad when Hector, the great prince of Troy, 
has this you know, prophetic moment. And I'm gonna read the, the passage that it comes from in a moment. And when Polybius spoke to Scipio freely, for Polybius, who the Roman historian, you know, was a Greek, was brought to Rome as part of the conquests, and Scipio was the student of Polybius. And Polybius was there apparently with Scipio during this moment. And Polybius asked him the meaning of his words. They say that without any attempt at concealment, Scipio named his own country. He said that when he reflected on the condition of all human things, he felt fear for what must eventually happen to Rome. Polybius heard him speak these words and recorded them in his history. So, you know, one might ask the question, um, you know, where does this come from in, in Scipio's culture? And, and, and I have to say too, I mean, you know, I, I don't, I don't wanna be, you know, overly positive about this. Scipio didn't say stop the madness. He didn't say let's let's don't car you know let's don't destroy Carthage. Let's stop being imperial. Let's stop enslaving other people. He didn't he didn't say that. But the sight of Carthage being des destroyed excited his feelings of sympathy and compassion and this sense of shared mortality. And I, I want to suggest that that is that is the main thing that the that the Iliad in the in the ancient Greek world you know was thought of as as delivering the Iliad um, ends with Achilles um, putting down his wrath um, after Achilles has killed Hector because Hector killed Achilles's beloved companion Patroclus and Achilles has been you know dragging Hector's body around behind his chariot attached to it because he can't get over his grief for Patroclus. And at the end of the poem, King Priam, Hector's father, gets together a ransom and comes to Achilles risking his life and begs for the body of Hector to be returned. And Achilles, you know, against all expectation, looks at Priam's face, thinks about his own father, whom he'll never see again, um, and decides to give the body to Hector for burial. And the, and the poem, the Iliad ends with the funeral of Hector. The last line of the poem is, and that's how they buried Hector, breaker of horses. It's not, you know, it doesn't end, and that's how they conquered Troy, because Troy doesn't get conquered in the poem. You know, the poem is just about this, this one episode that happens in less than, less than two months. Uh, this moment when, when the Greeks almost lost it through this, through this crisis. Um, I could start with a proem in Alexander Pope's translation of, of the proem, but I'm not going to. I've already said far more than I intended to say about the Iliad, unsurprisingly. So I want to switch instead to this episode. It's a rather long episode. Please bear with me. But it's in book six. This is, this is where, we, where this line that Scipio, at, at the destruction of, of Carthage, quoted, this is the moment in the poem when Hector realizes that he needs to go back home to Troy. He needs to go back to try to propitiate the, the goddess uh, to, to win the, her favor um, for Troy. And when he comes back, he enters back into feminine space. His mother offers him wine and tries to you know, get him to drink some wine so that he won't go out to the battle. Um, he, he sees other people in his household. And then he has this amazing exchange um, with his wife. And we learn about uh, Andromache's life, and we learn about, you know, we learn things about their marriage, uh, and, and their little boy Astyanax is there as well. And Astyanax is going to be thrown off the, the ramparts of, of the city by the Greeks because they say, we can't have the heir to the royal throne of Troy survive because he'll grow up and, and you know, he'll, he'll come back and, and, and take revenge on us. So here's Here's the exchange between Hector and Andromache. And as I say, it's, it's long, but let's just settle into it. So the housekeeper spoke. And Hector hastened from his home backward by the way he had come through the well-laid streets. So as he had come to the gates on his way through the great city, the sky and gates, whereby he would issue into the plain, there at last his own generous wife came running to meet him, Andromache, the daughter of high-hearted Eetion, Eetion who had dwelt underneath wooded Placos, in Thebe below Placos, lord over the Kilikian people. It was his daughter 
who was given to Hector of the bronze helm. She came to him there, and beside her went an attendant, carrying the boy in the fold of her bosom, a little child, only a baby, Hector's son, the admired, beautiful as a star shining, whom Hector called Scamandrios, and that's from the name of a river in Troy, the Scamander, but all, but all the others called him Astyanax, which means Lord of the city, since Hector alone saved Ilion. Hector smiled in silence as he looked on his son, but she, Andromache, stood close beside him, letting her tears fall. And she clung to his hand, and she called him by name, and spoke to him, dearest, your own great strength will be your death, and you have no pity on your little son, nor on me, ill-starred, who must soon be your widow. For presently the Achaeans, gathering together, will set upon you and kill you. And for me, it would be far better to sink into the earth when I have lost you, for there is no other consolation for me after you have gone to your destiny, only grief. Since I have no father, no honored mother, it was brilliant Achilles who slew my father, Eetion, when he stormed the strong-founded citadel, citadel of the Kilikians, Thebe of the towering gates. He killed Eetion, but did not strip his armor, for his heart respected the dead man, but burned the body in all its elaborate war gear and piled a grave mound over it. And the nymphs of the mountains, daughters of Zeus of the Aegis, planted elm trees about it. And they who were my seven brothers in the great house all went upon a single day down into the house of the death god. For swift-footed, brilliant Achilles slaughtered all of them as they were tending their white sheep and the lumbering oxen. So, so Andromache is describing what's happened. Her whole fan, all, all her male kin have been killed in war and she has been at some point given, transferred to, to Hector, right? Uh, and that's how she became ultimately Hector's wife. And when he had led my mother who was queen under wooded Placos here, along with all his other possessions, Achilles released her again, accepting ransom beyond count. But Artemis of the showering arrows struck her down in the halls of her father. That means she got sick and died. When people die of plague in this poem, uh, if, they're, if they're women, that means they were, they, the way it describes it is they were shot by the arrows of Artemis. And if they're men, they're shot by the arrows of Apollo. The Iliad begins with a plague and it's described as the, as the anger of Apollo shooting uh, arrows at, at the troops. Hector, thus you are father to me and you are my honored mother, you are my brother and you it is who are my young husband. Please take pity on me then and stay here on the rampart, right? Don't go fight, that you may not leave your child an orphan, your wife a widow, but draw your people up by the fig tree, there where the city is openest to attack and where the wall may be mounted. Three times their bravest came that way and fought there to storm it about the two Ajaxes, the two Ayantes and renowned Idomeneus about the two Atreidae, that's Agamemnon and his brother uh, Menelaus, and the fighting son of Tydeus, that's Diomedes. Either some man well-skilled in prophetic arts had spoken, or the very spirit within themselves had stirred them to the onslaught. So that's what Andromache says, please don't go back to the battle. Uh, I don't want to lose you just as I lost all the men of my family. Then tall Hector of the shining helm answered her, all these things are in my mind also, lady. Yet I would feel deep shame before the Trojans and the Trojan women with trailing garments, if like a coward, I were to shrink aside from the fighting. So this is very much a culture of honor and shame, right? Hector does not say, I have to protect my city. He says, I'm bound by honor and shame and shame will not allow me to stay inside the city. That's, that's, that's the way that motivation works for um, for the heroes of the, of the Homeric world. And the spirit will not let me since I have learned to be, to be valiant and to fight always among the foremost ranks of the Trojans, winning for my own self great glory and for my father. For I know this thing well in my heart and my mind knows it. There will come a day when sacred Ilium shall perish 
and Priam and the people of Priam of the strong ash spear. So, right? so on the one hand, he says, shame won't let me stay here. I have to go fight. But I also know, I know in my heart that this is the end of my city. Um, but it is not so much the pain to come of the Trojans that troubles me. No, not even of Priam the king, nor Hecabe his mother, not the thought of my brothers who in their numbers and valor shall drop in the dust under the hands of men who hate them, as troubles me the thought of you, when some bronze armored Achaean leads you off, taking away your day of liberty in tears. So she will become a slave again. And traditionally that's the way and Andromache uh, is, is portrayed, you know, as enslaved again. Um, when some bronze armored Achaean leads you off, taking away your day of liberty in tears. And in Argos, you must work at the loom of another and carry water from the spring Messias or Hyperea, all unwilling, but strong will be the necessity upon you. And someday seeing you shedding tears, a man will say of you, this is the wife of Hector, who was ever the bravest fighter of the Trojans, breakers of horses in the days when they fought about Ilion. So will one speak of you, and for you it will be yet a fresh grief to be widowed of such a man who could fight off the day of your slavery. But may I be dead and the piled earth hide me under before I hear you crying and know by this that you drag you, that they drag you captive. I mean, it's very strange, right? Um, he, he's saying, uh, at least I will be dead after these horrible things happen to you. So just one more little paragraph. So speaking, glorious Hector held out his arms to his baby who shrank back to his fair girdled nurse's bosom screaming and frightened at the aspect of his own father, terrified as he saw the bronze and the crest with its horsehair nodding dreadfully as he thought from the peak of the helmet. Then his beloved father laughed out at his honored mother and at once glorious Hector lifted from his head the helmet and laid it all in its shining upon the ground. Then taking up his dear son, he tossed him about in his arms and kissed him and lifted his voice in prayer to Zeus and the other immortals, Zeus, and you other immortals grant that this boy who is my son may be as I am, preeminent among the Trojans, great in strength as am I, and rule strongly over Ilion. And someday let them say of him, he is better by far than his father, Right. It's quite incoherent, right, what Hector is saying, right? At one moment, he's saying, I know my city is going down. And another moment, he's saying, at least I'll be dead when, when my wife is a slave. And now he's saying, well, I hope that my son, you know, comes after me and, 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 and becomes the, you know, the ruler of Troy after me. He has all these, you know, completely contradictory thoughts and emotions. It's like he's, he's crumbling under the crisis that, that he's facing in, in some ways. And someday let them say of him, he's better by far than his father as he comes in from the fighting and let him kill his enemy and bring home the blooded spoils and delight the heart of his mother. Right. And so, and then, then he tells uh, Andromache, right, to, to go back to the, the loom and the distaff and that he's gonna go and fight. He picks up his helmet and his wife goes back home, letting the live tears fall. And so they mourned in his house over Hector while he was still living because they thought he would never come back from the fighting alive, escaping the Achaean hands in their violence. In fact, he comes back to the city, but not inside so that they're able to see him killed uh, by Achilles and then, and, then, and then dragged away. So that's the moment of this poem that comes alive, you know, for a Roman general, Scipio Emilianus, looking at the great enemy, the great, you know, century-long rival of, of Rome, uh, and, and, and Scipio remembers Hector, he remembers Troy, and he thinks about, you know, the shared mortality of human beings and the shared mortality of, um, of political communities together. Okay, so that much about Homer. Are there any questions or observations, things, things in chat um, at this point, things that that brought up for people? 
yeah, it looks like we, we do have a couple of comments. And again, I encourage everybody to kind of keep them coming. Um, okay. Yeah, one comment here from Francis. Uh, this is, uh, I think, a comment on something earlier that you shared, um, just talking about, you know, how we view Aeneas. Um, Francis says there is a tradition of likening Columbus to Aeneas. So that's not a question, but it's a comment. And I don't know if, if you're familiar with that or if you had thoughts on that comment uh, Francis said. Yeah, yeah, that's, it's, it's great. Um, there, there is, there is that tradition. And there's a whole tradition in, in the New World, um, maybe especially in South American literature, of weaving the Homeric uh, mythology into the stories of, um, of colonization, right? And, and sort of weaving, um, weaving what happens in, in the New World, what happens in the Americas, back into the Trojan stories. Uh, I guess the most famous colonial epic from, from early modernity is, uh, is Portuguese. It's uh, the Lusiads by, by Camões, and it, it tells the story of uh, Vasco da Gama, and, and it has, uh, it uses the whole, you know, Greek, uh, the, the whole Greco-Roman pantheon, uh, but the Christian God is also in, in the poem. So yeah, so there's, there's, there's this amazing um, amalgam of, of Greco-Roman mythology and then sort of uh, New World ideology. And, and again, it's, you know, it's possible to read all of that with, you know, with, with, with a lot of lucid suspicion and, and that's, all, that's all warranted. Um, and at the same time, it seems always the case that, that these, these poetic, you know, reworkings, these, these poetic receptions of the epic tradition also tend always to open out into the possibility of, of seeing the other you know, with a with a surprising level of of compassion and um and and interest. So yeah, thank you, thank you for that. Anything else? Well, we have kind of a meta question from Leo. Uh, which yeah. Tr yeah, which translation did you use, and which do you recommend? Yeah, that's a great question. I love that question. So the translation I used is the translation by Richmond Lattimore, and um. It's a great translation. It's available on the Chicago Homer. Um, I tend not to um, I tend not to use it for for teaching um, these days. It's it's just hard. It's it's hard to sit down and and read. Um, there's a there's a translation by Stanley Lombardo that is some um, very sort of you know fast paced and energetic. Um, uh, it's it's surprisingly close to Homer's Greek and people often think it isn't because it's so snappy and almost colloquial at moments. Um, there are lots of, lots of really good translations of the Iliad too though. Um, I love Alexander Pope's though I would never teach that one uh, by itself. There's a recent translation by, by Peter Green that I just finished teaching and um, it's okay, but it's, it, it's, it's definitely not uh, in an American poetic Idiom. You know, Peter Green is 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 very much a, a UK um, you know classical scholar, and so his language rhythms and, and thought rhythms um, are are very different. I recommend that if you're looking for a translation of the Iliad, I recommend that either on you know on the website wherever you're shopping for books, um, make sure that you can read a sample of of the translation. And if you don't like it, if if, if it doesn't work for you, then don't get that translation. Um, some, sometimes people are, uh, people want to know which one is the closest to the Iliad. Um, I don't think that that's the way to think about it. They're all close to the Iliad. You, you don't want a translation that is, you know, word for word or necessarily line for line as, as Lattimore's is. You want a translation um, that you feel close to, that, that, that you can engage with. Yeah, great. Okay. Great. Well, yeah, we've had a couple of other questions come in, which is fantastic. So um, Suzanne has a comment and a question. So um, for Suzanne, the passage when Hector and Andromache are with Scamandrius is the most poignant in the poem. They are right where he will be killed during the sack of Troy. How early is that tradition about his death attested? Is that something you're, you are familiar with? Mm, what a great question. What a great question. So um, I can't tell you, you know, what the, the earliest attestation of it is, 
But uh, for the Greek tragedians, you know, the, the death of Astyanax is, is very important. Um, and so uh, you know, it, it's, it's very important in Euripides' play, for example, Andromache. Um, and, and then the Roman poets um, take it back up. Um, the, that, that tradition does go back, though. And I'm inclined to think that it's more likely than not that, uh, that it already existed at the time of the Iliad. Just as, for example, you know, the sacrifice of Iphigenia is never mentioned in the, Ili in the Iliad, but if you think of it in the background, it really makes a lot more sense of, um, of Agamemnon's actions in, in the poem. So that, that's a great question. Um, awesome, great. Yeah. Uh, what yeah about I the Fagel's translation? I like the Fagel's translation. I've, I've taught the Fagel's translation. Um, it's, it's good. It's just personally, it's not for me a translation that just really resonates for me, um, but, but I like it. I really like Fagel's translations of Greek tragedy. I think he really shines there. Um, but he's somebody who was very serious about poetry. So, you know, that, that matters. Yeah. Ooh, this next question from Anthony. Similarities between Iliad Odyssey and Aeneid on the one hand, and, and then things like Gilgamesh and the Mahabharata. So I'm going to give a short answer, because if I give a long answer, I won't be able to say anything else. So um, the Iliad and the Odyssey are like Gilgamesh and the Mahabharata in that they are the result of a generations long and indeed centuries long um, oral tradition. So we have you know, a written poem, but there were many different versions of it. And there are different versions of Gilgamesh, of course. Um, the Mahabharata is this you know, vast poem that includes so many different episodes in itself. Um, here are some things that are kind of special about the Iliad, though, about, about Homer's uh, Greek epic. It's uh, the, about the language. It's a language that includes dialect forms from everywhere that Greek was spoken. Uh, and that's interesting. And it includes dialect forms from different points in the history of the language. So it's no human Greeks, you know, um, uh, speech. And, and so it's Panhellenic. Uh, not just at the level of the theme, you know, the Trojan War and all, the, all these different Greek peoples coming together, but it's Pan-Hellenic, it's a Pan-Greek poem, even at the level of, um, of, of language. Um, and the cultural authority of the poem is hard to overstate. It's like Shakespeare plus the Bible put together, something like that. So yeah, that's a great, great question. Wonderful, wonderful. Okay, great. So let's, let's go back in. And let's talk about, um, let's talk a little bit about the Aeneid. Uh, we'll see if I have any time left over for, um, for Omeros at the end. So um, maybe I will do the, uh, the proem of the, um, of the Aeneid. This is John Dryden's uh, translation. So it's, it begins, arms and the man I sing who forced by fate and haughty Juno's unrelenting hate, at least two cheers for Juno. I'm inclined to say three, three cheers for Juno. Expelled and exiled, left the Trojan shore. Long labors, both by sea and land he bore, and in the doubtful war, before he won the Latian realm and built the destined town, his banished gods restored to rights divine and settled sure succession in his line, from whence the race of Alban fathers come and the long glories of majestic Rome. And right after that, we begin to hear about the anger of Juno. Juno is still angry about the Trojan War, and she's still angry at Aeneas, and she would like to wipe Aeneas out. And then we go on. The next thing that happens is we hear about Carthage, because Aeneas is about to be um, driven off course by a storm that Juno gets the king of the winds to send to Aeneas to drive him off course so he can't get to Italy. And he winds up on the shores of North Africa, and he, he, he comes to Carthage as Carthage is being built by its culture hero, and its culture hero is Queen Dido, right? Um, and um, Aeneas sees it. Um, he, he, well, well, Dido falls in love with Aeneas, uh, and, and it's no fair because Aeneas' uh, mother is Venus, and sh she is the one who, you know, poisons Dido with love, with passion for uh, for Aeneas, and she does it simply to protect Aeneas. Um, and it really, you, you could really think that um, 
that the the sexual encounter between Aeneas and Dido um, figures the rivalry between Rome and Carthage. Um, Dido's ancient mythology was that she came to Carthage as a widow and that she preserved her, her, you know, her widowly chastity against all the suitors uh, in, in Africa who wanted to marry her. And in the ancient tradition, she throws herself on a funeral pyre to preserve herself. Uh, and that that's how she, uh, and that, you know, the chastity of her body, you know, then becomes a figure for the power of Carthage as a, as a Mediterranean, um, you know, political, political power. But then Aeneas comes, right, in, in the epic and, and undoes all of that. So in Virgil's version of the story, Dido is killing herself all right, but she's killing herself because Aeneas is now leaving after the year that they've had, the, the love affair that they've had. Dido, I think everybody pretty much agrees who reads, who reads the Dido steals the show, right? Dido is by far the most engaging character, the most sympathetic character, and she's the culture hero of Rome's great enemy, Carthage. Um, and when she curses Aeneas before she dies, she, she puts on him a curse that really makes the, you know, the, the Punic Wars between Rome and Carthage sound like they come from Dido's, Dido's curse. So here's some, here's um, Dido preparing her pyre that she's going to throw herself upon. Uh, she kills herself with, it, with Aeneas' sword, uh, and she utters these amazing grand words. O oh, son, fiery witness to all earthly deeds and Juno complicit in my unhappy love. Hecate worshiped with howls at midnight crossroads, avenging furies and gods of dying Elissa. Elissa is Dido's um, Semitic name. It's, it's, it's her own name for herself. Attend to this. Turn the force of your wrath upon sins that deserve it. Oh, hear my prayer. If this criminal is destined to make harbor again, and this criminal is Aeneas, if this is what the fates and Jupiter demand, may he still have to fight a warlike nation, and her curse comes true, be driven from his land and torn from Eulus, that's his son. May he plead for aid and see his people slaughtered. And when he has accepted an unjust peace, May he not enjoy his reign or the light of day, but die before his time and lie unburied on a desolate shore. This is what I pray for. These last words I pour out with my blood. And you, my Tyrians, must persecute his line throughout the generations. This your tribute to Dido's ashes. May treaties never unite these nations. May no love ever be lost between them. And from my bones, may some avenger rise up to harry the Trojans with fire and sword now and whenever we have the power. May coast oppose coast, waves batter waves, arms clash with arms. May they ever be at war, they themselves and their children forever. Right? So the, the great rivalry between Rome and Carthage is being portrayed here as, as the fulfillment of Dido's curse. Dido said these things and then set her mind on a quick escape from the hated light. She exchanged a few words with Barque, Sicaeus' nurse. So Sicaeus is Dido's husband who was killed by Dido's brother, and Barque is the name of the nurse. Barca is the surname of Hannibal. Right? So Virgil is reminding us that this is the royal family of Carthage that is going to produce the general who almost destroys Troy. Her own, her own nurse was black ashes back in the old country. And she says, dear nurse, bring my sister Anna here. Oops, went too far. Bring my sister Anna here. Have her sprinkle her body with river water and bring along the victims for expiation. You come with her and wreathe your brows with wool. I intend to complete the rites to Stygian Jove that I've begun and so end my troubles. And to send the Trojans pyre up in flames, she spoke. The old woman quickened her step. Dido trembled, panicked at the enormity of what she had begun. 
eyes bloodshot, blotched cheeks quivering, pale with looming death, she burst into the innermost, innermost part of the house, climbed the pyre like a madwoman, and unsheathed the Trojan sword, a gift not sought for such a use. The sight of the familiar bed and the clothes he wore made her stop in tears. Struggling to collect herself, she lay upon the couch and spoke her final words. Love spoils sweet while heaven permitted, receive this soul and free me from these cares. I have lived and I have completed the course assigned by fortune. Now my mighty ghost goes beneath the earth. I built an illustrious city, I saw my walls. I avenged my husband and made my evil brother pay. Happy, all too happy if Dardanian Trojan ships had never touched our shores. Dido spoke and pressing her face into the couch. We will die unavenged, but we will die. This is how I want to pass into the dark below. The cruel Trojan will watch the fire from the sea and carry with him the omens of my death. With these words on her lips, her companions saw her collapse onto the sword, saw the blade flom foaming with blood and her hands spattered. So since it's almost seven, I have an idea, if you'll bear with me. Instead of answering questions right now, I just want to cut to a passage in Omeros. Um, so Omeros you know, has the, the, a present day storyline that is uh, Caribbean um, fishermen and laborers who possess in their French form the name of Homeric heroes. And, and there's one character named Achille, Achilles in French. And we learn that he has an ancestor named Afolabe. And Afolabe is brought to St. Lucia from Africa by slave traders in, in you know, transatlantic slavery. And there's this moment. Uh, 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 so, you know, epics tend traditionally to have what is called a catabasis, and that is an underworld journey where the hero goes to the world below. It happens in Gilgamesh, it happens in the Aeneid, it happens in the Odyssey. It doesn't exactly happen in the Iliad, um, but, but other, other stuff that's comparable happens. So uh, Achille in Omeros gets something like a catabasis. He's a fisherman, he gets bonked in the head with his fishing boat, he passes out, and he has this out of body experience where he transcends time and he goes back to 18th century Africa and he sees um, his ancestors being abducted and being, you know, being taken into transatlantic slavery. And here is this astonishing moment in the poem. It's, it's kind of overwhelming in that um, um, those who were brought across in transatlantic slavery are given an epic voice in, in this poem. So here it is. So it's Achille. Now Achille, now he heard, he's in his trance, he's been knocked out by his, by his boat, and, and he's, you know, his consciousness is swimming, and he's now experiencing the griot, who is um, the name for an African oral poet, an African singer of tales, you know, with this thought that, that oral poetry you know, narrative oral poetry is a world phenomenon, a species phenomenon. So now he heard the griot muttering his prophetic song of sorrow that would be the past. It was a note long drawn and endless in its winding like the brown river's tongue. So here's what they sing. We were the color of shadows when we came down with tinkling leg irons to join the chains of the sea for the silver coins multiplying on the sold horizon. And these shadows are reprinted now on the white sand of antipodal coasts. Your ashen ancestors from the bite of Benin, from the margin of Guinea. There were seeds in our stomachs, in the cracking pods of our skulls, on the scorching decks, the tubers withered in no time. We watched as the river gods changed from snakes into currents. When inspected, our eyes showed dried fronds in their brown irises, and from our curved spines, 
the rib cage radiated like fronds from a palm branch. So you get it when he says when, when inspected, right? He means when we were brought from Africa and put on the auctioneer's block in slave markets, right? That in that moment, right, our bodies are, are showing, you know, this, this, this flowering of, of, of African flora. Um, and that, you know, that our, our gods have come with us and yet they're, they're being transformed. Then when the dead palms were heaved overside, the ribbed corpses floated riding to the white sand they remembered to the bite of Benin, to the margin of Guinea. Right, so the corpses being thrown overboard in the Atlantic Passage. So when you see burnt branches riding the swell, trying to reclaim the surf through crooked fingers after a night of rough wind by some stone white hotel past the bright triangular passage of the wind surfers, remember us to the black waiter bringing the bill, right? So, you know, St. Lucia's, you know, modern day, you know, um, vacation resort culture, right, with its racialized division of labor, right, is being captured up through, through the power of this epic poem, right, into, uh, into the Homeric tradition, right, and also into, into a tradition of world oral poetry that includes the griot of Africa, that includes the epic of Gilgamesh, that includes the, the Mahabharata, uh, you know, that includes the, the, the Popol Vuh from, from indigenous um, uh, um, American you know, um, speech communities. Uh, and um, it, it's one of the many strands of, um, of Walcott's poem that, that produces a kind, of, um, a kind of epic imagination of the new world. I'll, I'll keep reading a little bit more. But they crossed. They survived. There is the epical splendor. Multiply the rain's lances, multiply their ruin. The grace born from sub subtraction as the hold's iron door rolled over their eyes like pots left out in the rain. And the bolt rammed home its echo the way that thunderclaps perpetuate their reverberation. That thing that he just did, right? Those are epic similes, right? It's like, it's from Homer, you know, that, that, that he's getting this. Homer is the one who taught the world how to, you know, uh, suddenly introduce these, these similes from things that happen in nature, pots left out in the rain and thunderclaps. So there went the Ashanti one way, the Mandingo another, the Igbo another, the Guinea. Now each man was a nation in himself without mother, father, brother. And so Walcott's poem can be thought of as, as you know, affecting a kind of nation building for, um, for, for communities that, that have been um, deracinated or, you know, um, um, marginalized and barred from the status of nation. Um, a lot more that could be said about that and the and and the other poems and and the other passages that I that I talked about in that regard. So uh, I'll just say one one thing before I open up to, to more comments and questions. My plan in this course that I'm offering in the winter is to read these texts alongside some uh, some essays um, about you know, colonial and post-colonial theory and thinking about um, ethnicity, race, identity. Um, in, in connection with uh, the, the poetic tradition and specifically the, the epic tradition. Some of Walcott's uh, own essays, like especially an essay called The Muse of History is really powerful um, in that regard. And Walcott expresses so much tenderness for the, um, you know, like for the, for the, the middle-aged white person's consciousness that, 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 that is, you know, that, that is portrayed in the poem in the person of this guy Plunkett, you know, who is you know, like this retired military guy who lives on the island and becomes obsessed with history, you know, and, and, and learns everything he can about the, the Battle of the Saints. And for Walcott, this, this person is part of, um, 
you know, part of Walcott's cultural identity as well. So those are, those are some things that had occurred to me to say tonight about this topic. Um, and so from, for the rest of the time, let's, let's see what comes up in the form of conversation about either any of these specific texts or about, um, about the epic tradition in, in, in regard to things like identity and, and nation building. Excellent. And thank you. Yeah, um, uh, I think the earliest comment that we haven't gotten to yet, um, this is a question uh, from Suzanne. Could you say more about the etymology of the name Alyssa? Is that, and this is um, the uh, Neid, um, uh, is that a North African name slash language? Um, just wanted to confirm that you said that it was Semitic. Could you share a little more? Yeah, sure, sure. Um, it is indeed a Semitic name, and that L is the same L as the Hebrew L that means God, as in Gabriel, Daniel, all those names, Joel, all those names. Um, so that was the name that, that she had apparently in Phoenician, which was a Semitic language, and that's her, that is traditionally her place of origin. Dida was apparently an African word. It's a word in an, in an African language that means wanderer. Um, and all of that, all of that tradition existed before uh, before Virgil ever wrote, and that was apparently part of Carthage's own, you know, mythology about their cultural foundation. You know, it's cool that he knows that, right? I mean, the Romans knew things about um, about Carthaginian culture, and of course, Carthage, Carthage, you know, was a Hellenistic uh, um, a Hellenistic city, a Hellenistic culture. By that I mean, you know, it, it was a culture that was as much steeped in in Greek culture as as the Roman world was as well. Everybody in in the 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 the, the ancient Mediterranean world, you know, that's why the Gospels were written in Greek because it was a language um, that a lot of people could read all around the Mediterranean including the ancient Near East and including North Africa. But yeah, it's a, it's a Semitic language, Phoenician was. Great. Um, yeah. This is cut, kind of, yeah, this is kind of related to something that you were um, just mentioning, um, a comment question from Francis. Now mm -hmm. Homer worked with the cultural tradition. Didn't Virgil create a story out of whole cloth? Uh, mm -hmm. Thoughts and responses, David. Mm -hmm. That's a great question. Um, the short answer is um, is is no that he's um, he's not making the story out of, out of whole cloth. Um, there are a lot of the story it includes material from the Iliad. A lot of it is material from the Roman cultural tradition and also earlier Roman authors. Um, Virgil was not the first writer to talk about Dido either. Uh, a, a predecessor. Uh, uh, named Ennius, an epic poet whose epic we don't have, it was lost, um, also, also talks about that. So, um, and, and uh, the tradition of Aeneas as, as a hero, um, long predated Virgil as well. There's, there's even some archaeological evidence that he had a hero cult in Italy, um, you know, in, in the early days. So there's no, there's no pre-Greek Roman culture, you know, from, from the earliest times, um, Greek cultural influences were already uh, already in Italy, so it's um. I mean, it's true that the you know you know um, Augustus uh, Octavian um, was pressing this ideological story of of himself as the adopted son of Julius Caesar, and and the claim of the Aeneid is that Julius, the name Julius, is derived from the name Iulus, which is the name of Aeneas's son. And so that's the so the claim is that that you know Augustus through Julius Caesar comes from this bloodline and has Aeneas as an ancestor, meaning that he's descended from the goddess uh, Venus. And that part, yeah, that's that's you know that's Octavian's own particular um, ideological thing that that, that that he's pushing, and that is very much served up by um, Virgil's Aeneid. Um, but the rest of it, um, you know, seems to be rooted in in a whole sort of patchwork, a whole web of of Roman and Greek and ancient Mediterranean traditions. Yeah, yeah, great question. Thank you. Great. Yeah, well, moving along, 
A question from Thomas, what do you make of how these epics deal with the integration of outsiders into a new native culture uh, to the point of founder status and the relatively seamless intermingling of cultures, Trojan Greek, uh, Phoenician Trojan, Latin Trojan? Hmm. Hmm. This is a great question. I'm trying to understand just what, um, Precisely what what we what do you make of the integration of outsiders into a new native culture? Well, so let me talk about let me talk about the 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 integration of 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 Trojan you know of, of Aeneas and and Trojan culture into Italic Roman culture because that's that's quite surprising. You might have thought you know that that the Aeneid was going to say well. Troy, you know, Aeneas and his Trojans won this war. So, you know, Italy became somehow or other Trojanized. And that's very much not what happens. Because and, and Juno has a lot to do with this. You know, Juno, Juno finally relents at the end of the poem. You know, uh, and, you know, she and, she, you know, she and Jupiter have this conversation. And Jupiter is like, you know, look, fate is, uh, is on the side of Italy and Rome and, you know, please give in. And she says, okay, okay, I will, but I've got some conditions. And she says, look, um, my Italians are not going to stop speaking Latin. They are not going to speak Trojan and they're not gonna wear Trojan clothes. They're gonna keep wearing the toga, right? And so at that moment, you know, Juno becomes as it were the guarantor of the Latinness of the Latin people. And so it's, it's, it's really strange in that, you know, Aeneas comes to Italy, he founds a, a, a new, you know, new gains, a new clan, a new, a new line, but that really just consists in his arriving there. And he's, like, he's sort of like a, he's like a sperm cell, right, that, that, that arrives in Italy, um, but, but he doesn't, he, he's not allowed to do anything that looks like colonizing, um, you know, the, the, the existing culture that's there. That's interesting in light of Virgil too, because Virgil's not a Roman, you know? Virgil comes from Mantua in the north of Italy. His roots, his, his ethnic roots are not Roman, they're Italic, you know? So when he's writing about, you know, the native kings um, and, the, and, and, and the native warriors who are there and who are angry that, that Aeneas is coming, he's writing about his own ancestors, his own ethnic, his own ethnic people. Um, Juno wants um, Juno wants Aeneas to marry Dido, and he wants Aeneas to marry Dido so that he will disappear into uh, into African culture, to simply disappear in, into Carthage and and be gone. You know, um, marriage is so interesting in the Roman cultural imagination, right? As the the, the relationship between sex and marriage on the one hand, and then war and colonization. Um, on, on the other hand, um, the, the one, the one can really be a, a figure of the other. Yeah. So great. that's great. That's a great yeah. question. Yeah. Yeah, mm. we've got a few more too. Uh, keep them coming, everybody. Um, okay. But from, yeah, from Laura, uh, what would you say that plays, uh, in plays like Medea or the Baki, there is a different approach to the other or the non-Greek than in Homer. I, I can read that again. Um, would you say, I, I missed it up a little bit. Would you say that in plays like Medea or the Baki, there is a different approach to the other or the non-Greek than in Homer? Mm, that's a great, great question. That's a great question. So um, in, the, in the tragedies of Euripides, right? Uh, otherness is, it's true on the one hand, you know, really scary and really destructive. Um, but those characters very much get to have their their say. So, so Bacchus, for example, right, is is a god who is who is portrayed as coming from outside. Um, he's not really a foreign god. I mean, you know, historically, but but in in the tradition, he's portrayed as coming from elsewhere, and that's what happens in in the Bacchae. So basically, what hap the action of the Bacchae is the, the god Bacchus Dionysus um, comes to Greece, right. And the local, uh, the local ruler, uh, Pentheus, you know, tries to stop the worship of the god, but, but Pentheus' mother, Agave, is all into it, and the women of the city are all into it. 
And there's this amazing scene where Pentheus has Dionysus arrested. And there's this scene between them where Dionysus says, don't you, Dionysus says, don't you really want to know what the women are doing uh, in, in the woods? Doesn't it sound amazing and exciting? Wouldn't you like to dress up in women's clothing and, and go into the woods? You know, and Pentheus is sort of hypnotized and says, well, yes, I would. I, I really want to do that. And so he does that. He puts on women's clothes in, on, on the stage and, the, and then exits. And it's terrifying, the end of it. Um, his mother, Agave, comes in mad, you know, in, in the Bacchic trance, and she's carrying what, she, carrying what she thinks is the head of, a, of an animal that they've torn apart, but it's, it is, in fact, the head of her son. And she wakes up from her trance on the stage and realizes that she's holding the head um, of her son. So it's, it's really, it's, it's this really terrifying depiction of a power that, yeah, is, is other and, and is destructive, um, but but at the same time, you know, it's 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 being portrayed as a as a force that cannot be denied. And Bacchus, you know, Dionysus is entering the Greek pantheon in this in this play, like it or not. And um, and it's also true that that Pentheus, in a weird way, is becoming a, a hero whose cult can then be connected with the with the divinity. These weird other scary characters in in Euripides. All have their moment where they give a speech and you know and they explain their own viewpoint. So uh, you know uh, there are indeed differences with with the Iliad in, the, in that you know the others in Euripides really are scary and and and, and do monstrous things like Medea killing her her children. Um, but Medea has a point, right? Medea Medea has has been you know given a vow by Jason. And then they get back to Greece and Jason says, well, you know, for your good and the good of the kids, I really need to marry the local princess because then we'll be rich and happy and you know, we'll, we'll make it work out. And um, that's, the, that's the thing that Medea is, is responding to. So yeah, it's um, uh, the, the, the plays of Euripides are, are, so, um, are so powerful as, um, you know, questioning, like serving up the, the mythological stories and, all, and also um, questioning them by, by portraying them, you know, under, under surprising aspects. I don't know how well I did with that, with that question. Uh, I'd love to, you know, to do a course on the tragedies of, of Euripides for the MLA program sometime. They're endlessly interesting. So yeah, okay. Lovely. Great. Well, a uh, question from Alex that was also in my mind. Uh, what happened to the Carthaginians? Well, they did come back, but I mean, the Romans did, um, you know, wipe out, they, they destroyed the city and they even plowed, um, what is it? They actually plowed the furrows around it with salt so you couldn't grow anything for a really long time. Um, but they did rebuild Carthage, right? St. Augustine talks about going to Carthage, so it came back. But yeah, but but the Romans wiped it out and then it came back. That's what happened to Carthage. Great, <laughs> thank you. Um, yeah. uh, well, a question um, from uh, Krista. So uh, generally speaking, at about what time in a national identity does a cultural epic appear? Wow, that's a great question. Um, I don't know if there, I don't know if there's like a, you know, sort of, um, if we could do a kind of, what's the word that I'm seeking, sort of like timeline or sort of life cycle of a culture, you know, to say this is the moment when, a, when they get um, a national epic. But I will say this, um, in, um, in early modernity, there really is this drive on the part of European nations um, to want to have a poem that they can point to and say, you know how the Greeks have Homer and the Romans have Virgil? Well, we have this, right? And it seems to happen at very different points in, in different you know, linguistic histories. You know, the Italian language happens to get Dante and Dante just kind of dwarfs everything after Dante in, in, in that language. Uh, I don't mean to say, I don't mean to say that there's not a glorious, you know, tradition of Italian literature after Dante, because there is, but Dante is thought of as having this monumental status, and, and Dante even changes the language, right? I mean, the Italian language 
it is, is the way it is in large measure because of Dante's poem. You know, a certain dialect gets gets promoted by by a really powerful um, by a really powerful uh, linguistic artifact. Um, but think about the English language, right? I mean, Shakespeare has a lot more canonical authority, I think, than Milton does. But Milton is the one who does this thing of making a poem that the English, you know, speech community can point to and say, ah, now we have an epic poem. But it's not a nation building. You know, it's not a poem about how the English became English. It's, it's a poem that retells the story of, of, of Satan and, and all, all that fun stuff. Um, uh, so that, that's, that's a different one. Um, Portugal is interesting in, in that they, they get this epic that really is connected to the, um, the whole colonial imperial project very um, directly. So I guess the answer is that, that, there's, no, that there's no specific answer. Um, the, the, the French language, the French speech community, um, um, you know, more than once expressed the wish for an epic poem that they could they could you know could point to and get various poems um various poets attempted it and finally voltaire finally said um we french don't have an epic because les français n'ont pas la tête épique because french people don't have an epic head you know, we, we don't have we don't have an epic brain you know, so, so we have you know we, we produce monumental literature in in other genres that that was voltaire's claim right there's not really uh it, it, I mean, in, in German, it's, it's Goethe's Faust that people point to as the central, the central text, and that's a play, not an epic. But, but all of that really, really does come from the thing that Virgil did, the thing that Virgil did in the way of writing a literary epic that then took on the status that was comparable to Homer in the, in the Greek language. Anyway, that's, that's the best answer I've got tonight for that great question. Well, and the last thing that you just said is such a perfect uh, transition. You almost answered it a little bit to uh, this next question from Anthony. Do you yes. feel it was important to Virgil that he composed the Aeneid in order to bestow on Rome a pedigree which could rival or even surpass that of more ancient cultures? You know, um, Greece, yeah. Carthage, yeah. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. It was important to Virgil, it was important to, um, to, to the, the Latin speech community, to, to Rome. Um, and it is, it is astonishing when, when you look at uh, what we can see about the ancient, you know, Latin language reception of, of the Aeneid, how um, in the space of a generation, Virgil's Aeneid became the central text in, in the culture of the Latin language. I mean, it became the text that you know the, the kids studied in school instead of the bad you know bad Latin translation of the Odyssey that they used to study, and that bad translation doesn't exist, and it took the place of you know uh, it superseded Ennius, and we don't have a copy of Ennius's epic poem. It didn't it didn't last, um, uh, and and Virgil's poem quickly I mean I mean within a generation became the text that of which everybody knew long passages by heart and, and could quote. Um, and so, so absolutely, absolutely. Rome, um, Rome always regards, you know, Hellenistic, you know, the, the, the more prestigious Greek culture, um, you know, both as their own culture and also as a culture that, that, um, that puts them in, in, in a sort of secondary status. Um, you know, from the point of view of Greek culture, the Romans are barbarians, and that's that's kind of unpleasant to realize. Oh, right, the culture to which my you know the culture that has the highest you know prestige in the world regards me as as barbarian, and that that's that's the world that that speakers of the Latin language are operating in, and yeah, for for more than a century before Virgil, you can see that interesting sort of dynamic or dialectic of emulation and anxiety and, and competitiveness. So yeah, absolutely, absolutely. That's, that's the, the Aeneid does a kind of cultural and political work that is, that, that is hard to um, overestimate. Yep. 
Great. Um, I'm skipping around in the comments a bit just because there's some notes that are more relevant to this conversation about, you know, different cultural epic poems. Uh, Francis yep. proposes uh, for the U.S., you know, the U.S. has Moby Dick, um, and mm -hmm. that could be potentially considered, you know, the United States version of an epic poem. Um, I don't know if you have thoughts on that. A little bit. Um, one of the many reasons why I, I like that is that is that Moby Dick clearly has the kind of um, almost cosmic ambition that, it, that a huge epic poem has. Like Moby Dick wants to serve up not just a story, but, but wants to serve up the whole world. You know? um, and epic poems tend to do that as well. So yeah, yeah, I think there's a lot to that. Fantastic. Well, um, Suzanne also um, notes here that there is an old French translation of the Aeneid, um, Roman Denias. Um, yes, absolutely. Uh, there, there are a bunch of those, you know, old French reworkings of, of poems, and there, you know, there are traditions uh, in France and and elsewhere in Europe about you know integrating um, Homeric. Um, you know, Homeric heroes uh, in, into the, the foundation narratives, but absolutely, yeah. Old French is amazing, the, the, the reworking of Greco-Roman literature. Uh, there, there's so much there that, that, um, that is really, uh, it's, it's less well known and, and studied, but yeah, absolutely, absolutely. Fantastic, thank you. Um, we've got a couple more questions and um, I, we've got two more. Um, one uh, question, a follow up from Suzanne. Could you say more about Virgil and Mantua? Obviously the story of the foundation of Mantua really obsessed Dante since he had in his Virgilio tell a different version of the Inferno. Um, uh, is, I'm skipping the, the comment here. Uh, also, is it a Etruscan word? Um, so is Mantua an Etruscan word? Um, I don't know. I don't know what language Mantua is. Um, I'll say this though. Um, Almost all the ancient Roman authors, with the exception of Julius Caesar, were born outside of Rome, which, which is really interesting. Um, so um, Roman literature was written by these people who were not, you know, who, who didn't, didn't come from Rome, and they all worked very hard to achieve the, the prestige dialect of, of Latin. You know what I mean? Um, Latin is a language where in the ancient literature, you know, once you get to, to the classical period, we can see almost no dialect variation whatsoever, but we know that the ancient authors there on, on the ground were policing each other's language very, very carefully. Um, so, so Virgil is this, you know, Virgil's this character, yeah, who, who it's, it's a very traditional story. It's, 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 it's the story of most Roman authors. He was born outside Rome, um, he studied in Greece. We know they lived in Naples for a time, um, you know, and, and he, he didn't particularly like being in Rome. He, he tried to avoid Rome. Um, the Neapolitans gave him the nickname, um, uh, the Maiden, Parthenay, partly because that was, you know, connected to the name, one of the names of, of Naples, and also just because it was the sort of, it was a way of making fun of Virgil. Uh, yeah. Well, a final comment from Suzanne. I love the idea of the Roman language police. Oh, yeah. Very fun. Oh, um, absolutely. Um, they, they did. They, they really policed each other's language um, a lot. Yes. Yeah. You know, people um, like complain about the French language and the French Academy. Romans were like that, except they didn't have an academy. <laughs> yeah. Fantastic. A couple more questions here. So um, from Sarah, did Cervantes accidentally kill the epic poem by inventing the novel? Thoughts oh, on that? That's a great question. That, that, that really is great. Um, um, because it is true in the world that we live in, 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 in the modern world, right? The novel is the, the sort of default genre for, for a big work, right? And it always happens, right, that undergrad, teaching Homer to undergraduates and having them write canvas, you know, discussion posts on, 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 online, they'll say, you know, in chapter three of this novel, and, and I, I have to be, you know, the asshole professor says, no, 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 you can't say chapter three of this novel, it's book three of this epic. It's not a 
novel, it's an epic, it's not a chapter, it's a book. Um, but that points to something really, you know, um, really important for us, the novel really is the, the default genre. Um, so epic didn't didn't get killed off, but it, but it really did get displaced from its from its central position. That's that's really true. Great, thanks. Yeah, great question. Um, uh, one uh, comment here from Jennifer. The problem of the early English epic seems to be the issue of Angle land being uh, several different countries with independent poetic traditions. Beowulf has very little in common with the Arthurian cycle, and they are both very, very different from the Mab Mabig on, uh, I can't pronounce this, at Mabinogian. I'm not familiar yeah. with that one as much, but. Um, yeah. But yeah, I think that's an interesting point. I don't know if you have any last thoughts on that. Yeah, yeah that's great. That's great. Um, yeah, that's that. That seems right to me. And and um, you know, that's that's not a thing that I that I work on. But like like most you know humanities professors, I every now and then teach Beowulf in in translation, and that's that's really exciting to do. Um, um, you know, and and there are so many other uh, you know examples of of oral poetry from other traditions like you know, like the the Norse poems um, and and things like that and it's true that you know the things the things that 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 have to happen for for an epic poem to 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 get that status of, of nation building you know a lot of those causes lie outside the outside the the poetry right so in other words if somebody said well how come, how come we don't think of Beowulf as our national, you know, poem as speakers of English or our, you know, whatever you want to say, ethnic cultural poem? And a lot of that has to do with the history of England, right? And you know, and like um, 1066 and 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 so on. And and then the fact that that the English language changed so much and its and its culture and and history changed. I guess it must be right that there are you know, that, that there are epic epic poems or epic style poems from a lot of traditions in various parts of the world where, where the poem doesn't have the, the, the kind of status of, of, you know, nation nation building. But I think, um, I don't know how, I don't know that much about the Mabinogian, but, but, but is, it, is it the case that that's one of those poems that that is at least partly the product of 19th century philology. Like the, the Kalevala is, is, is pretty much, you know, is partly a product of 19th century philology. In other words, that, that there are these epic cultural, you know, or epic traditions that, that exist and, and, and these artifacts, but, that, but then somebody compiles them and makes them into, you know, something that then can be held up as, as the national epic. Of, of that tradition, I don't know. I've, I don't. I don't really know enough to say more than more than that. It was compiled in the 12th century. Wow, wow, that's cool. The um, let me see what, what I can show you about the um, about the uh, um, Kalevala. Yeah. So uh, it's Finnish, and well, you can just look at the at the Wikipedia um, article. Yeah, it's it's finished. I guess that must be the one that's a product of um, of nineteenth century philology. Um, what great questions! Wow, wow, um, wide ranging and really interesting questions. Is it time yeah. to switch gears and talk more about the MLA program? Uh, yes, it is. Um, but but first, before we do that, I just want to thank you and everybody. Uh, I've, I've taken a risk and let you unmute yourselves if you'd like to join me in applauding uh, Professor Ray's lecture tonight. So uh, I just want to say thank you. Um, thank you so much. Thanks, everybody. Great. Yeah, well, yeah, you know, we've got, uh, you know, about half an hour. Um, if you have any questions about the Master of Liberal Arts, um, you know, I'll stick around and I'm happy to share a little bit more about the program or any thoughts that you have. Um, and I'll just kind of conclude quickly. 
um, you know, we're going to be sharing the copy of this recording with everybody. And I'm actually going to stop the record button in a moment. So your questions aren't in the recording. Um, but yeah, thank you again, Professor Ray. You know, it's, it's conversations like this that we typically have in the Master of Liberal Arts program. And if you are interested, uh, he is going to be teaching a class as he shared in the winter term. Um, that we'll be uh, discussing some of the texts and some of the concepts that we discussed today. So uh, thank you again, uh, Professor Ray, and um, I'll go ahead and hit that stop uh, record button now if I can find it, and, um, and we'll stick around for questions.